Well, welcome again, everyone, to the online Soapbox Church. In Christian circles, the phrase born again is commonly used. So, John, how is this term understood in most churches? Yeah, so this, this phrase being born again, um, it's, it's used a lot in Christian circles. You'll hear people say, you know, I've, I've been born again. And of course, the, the main scripture that that's based on is in John 3, where um, Jesus was talking to one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, we know, went on to become a follower of Jesus. He was one of them that actually took down Jesus' body from the cross. But when we meet him in John 3, he's, he's definitely searching, but he's obviously not quite a believer at that stage. But Jesus says to him, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that's how important it is to be born again. But Nicodemus didn't quite understand. So he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, again, he's, he's thinking naturally. He's not, not getting it spiritually. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So here Jesus is elaborating a little bit more on what he, what he means by being born again, water and spirit. And of course, that refers the water part to water baptism, but also being born of the spirit. You know, being born again in God isn't a work of the flesh. It's a work of the spirit of God. And when we're born again, the spirit of God, it must be active in our life. We must become a new person as a result of that spirit. We'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. There's another scripture, 1 Peter 1 verse 23, which says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So here's another definition of what being born again is. The word of God, which is that incorruptible seed, it's a perfect seed, the word of God, it has taken root in our, in our minds, in our, in our hearts, and it's caused us to change. So, you know, that's what we, we all understand in Christian circles um, about that. However, it's quite common to sort of hear Christians say, well, I am born again, I am saved, and almost that's it. Um, the inference is that there's no more to do, um, I'm saved by grace, and even in extreme circles, there is this doctrine of once saved, always saved. In other words, they believe, you know, once you've been saved, once you've been born again, that's it, there's really nothing you can do to, to lose it. You've, you've been born again. So that's what we want to talk a little bit about today is just elaborate on the, the, the born again experience and really what it, what it is about. Well, John, do you think that understanding is correct biblically? Yeah, so this idea that we can say I'm born again and that's it. Um, no, you know, if we look through scripture, um, the answer actually becomes clear that being born again, it's a process. We can fall away. So um, it, it's a process of maintaining being a new, a new cre creation. Um, you know, this is a subject in itself, but I'm just going to give you a couple of scriptures. For example, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, he says, I keep under my body. I bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. Now, I remember talking to someone once years ago, and they believed in this once saved, always saved doctrine. And they said, oh, no, Paul was just talking about losing his ministry. Well, that that's just can't be true, because that's not the context. He's gone through the whole of 1 Corinthians 9 there, talking about the gospel. And now he says, me preaching to others preaching the gospel, he could be a castaway. In other words, he could lose the capacity to enjoy the benefits of that gospel that he, in fact, was teaching. So, like I say, being born again, when you, when you read the scriptures, it really is a process. And we might sort of say we're in the process of being born again. Now, I don't want to get pedantic. You know, if someone says I'm born again, I, I get that. I, I understand that. But from a theological point of view, 
it's more correct to say I'm in the process of being born again. And in fact, there's a scripture um, in in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, and I'm going to read to you from the, the BBE, which is the um, Bible in basic English, because it, it gives the true sense of the Greek. It says, the word of the cross seems foolish to those who are on the way to destruction, but to us who are, and some of your translation will say being saved, the BBE puts it, but for those of us who are on the way to salvation, it is the power of God. And I think that that puts it quite well and it exemplifies what we're talking about in this born again experience being a process. We are on the way to salvation. Uh, in 1 John 3 verse 2, John writes there, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, present tense, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So here's this relationship between the fact that we are in the present tense sons of God, we're in God, but it's obvious this isn't this isn't what it appears to be. We haven't attained to what we ultimately shall attain to. Romans 6, 11. Paul says, likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. So Romans 6 talks a lot about baptism and how in baptism we die with Christ. And he says, so therefore reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what we're supposed to do. But is that a reality? Are we dead to sin? No, not at all. And, and Paul actually says, um, in, the, in the next chapter in Romans 7, you know, I'm fighting this fight. Within me, there's this, this war going on. What I don't want to do, I do do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. And he's describing this battle. So obviously, in the, the born again and the salvation experience, we haven't attained yet, right? We're still on the, on the process. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5, Paul writes there, to deliver... And he's talking here about a person in the church who he wants turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Um, now, of course, we don't believe in the, the supernatural fallen angel Satan. The word just means an adversary in scripture. It can be used of human adversaries. It can be used of sin in the flesh. It can even be used of God. God is adversary sometimes, um, Satan in Hebrew. So Paul is saying, Turn this person over to the adversary for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, so that they might, you know, sort out their, their fleshly problem. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So you can see being saved is referred to a future time on the day Jesus comes. So it's not wrong to say, you know, I've been saved or I'm being saved, but ultimately we're not once and for all yeah. saved and set free from this body of sin until the Lord comes back. So, you know, these are just a few examples showing us that being born again, being saved, it's actually a process that we have a very close affinity with. God expects us to be a part of this process and building ourselves through this process. Dr. John, can you elaborate on the first two steps in the process of being born again? Yeah, so I think I think the Bible basically summarizes five, summarizes five steps for us. And the first of those is faith. Faith. Faith is basically just believing God. Um, Hebrews 11 verse 1 gives, gives the biblical definition. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you read the Bible, that there's a God that he created everything, there's a coming kingdom, you can't see that. You couldn't see God creating. You can't see God. You can't see the risen Christ. But faith says, well, actually, I believe that. You know, I, think, I think there's good reason for believing that. So you're going nowhere. <laughs> You can't be born again without that initial faith. And Hebrews 11 verse 6 
actually goes so far as to say, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there's another scripture saying that we must diligently seek him. This is a part of the process. So that's the first step. You, you, you've got to come to the place where you believe God, you believe his word. Now that first step, it leads you onto the second step because God's word says repent. The word repent just means turn around, do a 180. Stop going in the direction of sin, go the opposite direction towards God. And it's interesting in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, he was declaring the, the marvelous works of God and that spoken in tongues and the languages of, of all the Jews from around the world that were there in Jerusalem. And they, they were pricked. They were, they were convicted, the Jews there. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says this, repent, repent and be baptized. That's Acts 2, 38. So they believed the word. Now the second step was required where they repented of their sin because you can't come to God, you know, just being happy in your sin. You've got to come to God repentant of your sin. Romans 3, 23, well-known scripture says all everybody, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin, it, it causes us to fall short of a relationship with God. So how do we deal with sin? Well, the first thing we do is to repent of it. And at that time, God can start dealing with it in our lives by his spirit and his word. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death but the gift of, of, gift of God is eternal life. So again, until you acknowledge and repent of your sin, there can be no forgiveness of it. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. You see, this is a, a, a simile, if you like, a synonym for being born again. If you are born again, you become a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, again, is this the reality, though? Um, when I believed and I repented and discussed the third one next, which is baptism, I got baptized and I became a, a new creation. Did everything pass away? Did all my old bad thoughts, my old bad temptations my old bad weaknesses, did they all go? No, they didn't. They're still with me. But like I say, the being born again, the new creation process has begun. And hopefully after 40 odd years, things are changing a little bit. Um, not going to sort of brag about that. Hopefully, hopefully they have before God. So those are the first two steps we've got to take. We've got to believe and we've got to repent. So you mentioned the first step is baptism. So is this critical to being born again? Well, yes. Um, as we mentioned in Acts 2.38, when Peter said, you know, in reply to what shall we do to be saved, he said, repent and be baptized. And even Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, he says, go into all the world, speaking to his disciples, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved so they go hand in hand you know this belief repentance they go hand in hand with baptism and as you go through the book of acts you'll see every time the apostles preach to people and they convert people it's it's hand in hand the conversions are hand in hand with baptism and of course we don't believe in infant sprinkling that's not baptism. That's a man-made tradition. Uh, baptism involves, as the very Greek word means, to dip, to fully immerse. And of course, it's, it's representative of a death. When you go under the water, you are saying to yourself, I want to die 
with Christ. Just like you're under the water, it's as if you're buried. And the old man, by faith, you're saying the old man is dying. And as you come out of the water, it's a declaration that you want to rise just as Christ rose from the dead to be that new creation. So it's a symbolic thing. There's nothing magical about the water. You can use, you know, fresh water, salt water. Uh, we've baptized people in rivers, lakes, the sea, barrels, bathtubs, hot water, cold water. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a symbol. And it really is a test of obedience because it's one of those mm. things which is foolish. Yeah. You know, if, if you're proud, you could say, well, well, how does this help me? in the salvation process. A bit of water, nothing magical about it. I go for a swim, I have a bath. What's the difference? And God is an expert at separating pride from humility. And I've, I've talked to people who have said, no, I believe I ain't getting baptized. I don't have to be. I've got my relationship going with God. Well, well, that's just an act of disobedience because the scriptures say, unless you believe, repent, and get baptized, you, you can't be saved. And like I say, as you go through the book of Acts, you've got the Philippian jailer, you've got um, Lydia, you've got the Ethiopian eunuch, you've got Paul himself in, in Acts there and, and you know, many other examples. Every time people got converted, they were commanded. And in one place it says, Peter commanded Cornelius to be baptized. So yes, the third step baptism, it, it's it's essential for salvation. And that's not stuff we've made up that's from the word of god as we've seen makes me um think about like how like with naaman mm. being said to wash in the jordan seven times and like you know he sort of mm. fucked a bit of it that that yeah. it seemed a, a silly thing to do and yet they said well you know if you were told to go and you know do something great mm. you would you mm. would go and do it so the, yeah, the pride was the the issue exactly similar. And and if it wasn't for his yeah. servant saying, listen, master, yeah. you know, he's only asked you to do this. It's a simple thing. Why don't you just do it? Yeah. Then Naaman maybe wouldn't have got the blessing. So that's a good example. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, John, explain to us what is meant by enduring to the end. Is the fourth step? Yeah. So that's the, the fourth step in this process. So let's just quickly recap. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe, number one. You've got to repent of your sin, number two. Baptism comes in in number three. Number four. This is probably the hardest step of all. And, and I sum it up by describing it as enduring unto the end. Jesus, in his Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 24, he says, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. So again, you can't just get saved tomorrow, put salvation on the shelf, carry on the way you were. That's not endurance at all. So what does it mean by the end? Well, the end is either going to be when Jesus Christ comes, and at that point, judgment, salvation for whoever qualifies, or it's going to be the day of your death. I don't know which one will come sooner for you, but, but either way, we've got to live our life as if it's the last day we're alive. There's no guarantee of tomorrow. So we have to endure, endure unto the end. Mark 8, verse 35, Jesus said, whoever will save his life must lose it. Interesting. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. It's a beautiful scripture, you know, using the opposites there. And, and I hope you understand what he's talking about. We've got to give our life away, our natural life, to save it ultimately. For eternity but he says if you lose your life you'll actually save it so you know there's a bit of bit of uh, irony going on there and he actually goes on in the next verse to say for listen you know what what does it profit a man anyway if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul that that word soul nothing to do with having an immortal soul it's not, not taught in scripture. The word soul in the Greek is suki, um, from which we get psycho. You know, we, we use the word psychosomatic or psychologist, someone um, generally who deals with, with the mind. Um, but in the Greek, suki 
um, basically means life. Uh, it's used 105 times in the New Testament, and of those 105 times, 36 times it's translated life in the authorized version. So that's you know over a third. So basically, Jesus is saying, listen, if you gain the whole world, but you lose your life, what is the point of that? So you see, this is the fourth step. Be in being born again, we have, have to be prepared to sacrifice the old man, as we saw in Romans 6, to put the old man to death, to regard ourselves as dead to the old way and live as a new creation, listening to the word of God, the way God would have us act. And those of you who have been Christians for a little while, I think you will testify to the fact that there's been a change there. You know, the, the priorities that you used to have, they don't matter anymore. I mean, for me, when I first got converted, and there's been other you know, changes, thank God, since, but initially for me, I was very ambitious, very ambitious to get rich. And when I got converted, that just disappeared just like that. It was a miracle, a work of God. And no longer did I care about that. And others of you, it will be maybe smoking or, or drug addiction or anger or anxiety, whatever. All of those negative things of the flesh, being a new creation means they, they go. Okay, sometimes we need to learn how, how to deal with those things, but that's what the Spirit of God and the Word of God enables us to do. So enduring to the end, it's the fourth step and it's the one We've probably got to do the longest because it's going to take the rest of our life until we die or Jesus comes. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Scripture in Romans 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, mm. holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, you know, like we had the Old Testament, you know, and we had the law, and they were offering sacrifices which was never suffice you know Jesus comes along creates the door to save us we do this through baptism to acknowledge that and to be saved but then we are a living sacrifice mm. you know mm. so it's right. ongoing till till the end till yeah. the yeah. Christ return or, yeah. yeah and and what, what you said there Lenore again just stresses the fact that we're in covenant mm. that, that that's the word the Bible used covenant contract if you like uh, even relationship would be a modern modern sort of vernacular we are in covenant mm. with god we are in a relationship with god now any relationship it's two-way you know what sort of friendship is it when it's a one-way friendship it's not a friendship what sort of marriage is a marriage where mm. it's one way where only one loves the other and one ever speaks and one ever does anything for, that's 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 not a relationship so our relationship with god it is two-way he's done the hard part He's made a way possible for us to be forgiven our sin and be saved and be born again through the blood of Christ. But we still have to appropriate that. We have to want it by faith. We have to repent of our own free will, get baptized, which is a worth of work of faith, and then go through this process, as you said, mm -hmm. of presenting ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, your way, not yeah. my way. So, John, the final and is interesting what does scripture say about that right so the fifth step in the process is to be finally once and for all changed and first corinthians 15 uh it's my favorite scripture um i've got it on my bible cover i've got it up on the wall where it talks about you know death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory death has been swallowed up in victory and that chapter talks about how you know, this corruptible, which we are now, shall put on in corruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. Now, once that takes place, there's no going back, people. Don't think you can change your mind at that point. Because once you've been made immortal, you can't go back to the old ways anymore. Praise God for that. So all of our desires now, the endurance that's taking place, the hardships, the, the battle against that old enemy, the flesh, when we finally get to that day of the kingdom coming, our bodies shall be changed. Our minds shall be changed. There will be no more inclination within us to be tempted towards sin like, like there is now. And that 
is the final step on being ultimately born again. So someone might say, well, hang on, John. You know, how does that process, you know, where, where in scripture does that relate to being born again? You know, surely being born again is just when you start, you know, when you start becoming a Christian, that's like being a newborn baby. But you're sort of saying actually the end of the process you're saying that's also a part of us being born again. Well, where does the Bible say that? Well, I'm going to show you. Um, some of you might know the psalm. Some of you may never have noticed this, but I love the psalm. It is, to me, it's just one of those classic examples of God hiding, hiding a little gem of understanding in the psalms, you know, not where you expect it to be. But it's in the Psalms, it's an end time scripture, and it's relating to this final account where we are changed. And I'm going to read that to you. Psalm 87, I'm going to read verses 5 and 6, first of all. It says, of Zion, now Zion's just another name for Jerusalem, and this is talking about the new Jerusalem. Of Zion, it shall be said. All right, so this is a future thing. This is a prophecy. This one and that one were born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writes up the people that this one and that one were born in her. So like I say, Zion, it's the future New Jerusalem, the future city of God, where people are described as being born in her. Hmm little bit strange let's go on and in going on i'm actually going to go back <laughs> oxymoron i'm going to go back to verse two it says there the lord loves the gates of zion more than all the dwellings of jacob verse three glorious things are spoken of you O city of god i will make mention of rahab and babylon to them that know me Philistines, Tyre, Ethiopia, this man was born there. So here you've got these nations listed, Philistines, people from Tyre, Ethiopia, talking about people coming from those nations who are going to be born in Zion, and in verse 3, which is the city of God. Okay, so I hope you've put all those little pieces together. Zion, it's the city of God, and it's where people from different nations are, are described as being born in her. Right. The word of God is one, right? It's all written by God. Where else do we read this phrase, the city of God? I think most of you immediately will go to Revelation. Revelation 21 and 22. John sees the New Jerusalem, Zion. The city of God, that's what it's called, coming down from heaven with the Lord. It's coming to earth, of course, because it's basically heaven, the city of God coming to earth where, where we're going to dwell. And we also read in Revelation 2 verse 7, to him who overcomes, aha, does that remind you of the fourth step, enduring to the end, to him who overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life? which is in, where? It's in paradise. Now, that Greek word translated paradise, actually paradisos, you know, it's just a transliteration, English paradise, Greek paradise, paradisos. And you know what it literally means? A garden city. Paradisos, it means a garden city. So to him who overcomes, we will be able to eat of the tree of life. Okay, so someone might say, oh, listen, John, but, but the book of Revelation, it's all symbolic. You know, this, this tree of life, uh, it's, all, it's all symbolic. This tree of life, it's referring to Jesus. And, you know, we eat of him in the communion, blah, blah, blah. Well, see, this is where you've got to let scripture interpret scripture. Because if the tree of life in Revelation is symbolic, then what are you going to make of the tree of life of Genesis? Is that also symbolic? Well, I don't think Genesis reads symbolically, does no. it? It's a historical account of creation of man, their sin, 
and how they ate of the forbidden fruit and they were barred from eating what? The tree of life. Why? Because the tree of life gives immortality. And because they were sinners, they now could not have access to the tree of life. And, and Revelation actually tells us about the tree of life in, in chapter 21, how it lines the river of life and how that the, the fruit are eaten and the leaves are for the healing of the nation. So this beautiful scripture in Psalm 87 is a prophecy telling us how that we're ultimately going to be born, born again, eating of the tree of life in the city of God. And of course, you piece all those things together from Revelation 2, Revelation 21, Psalm 87, which talks about being born in the city and eating of this tree of life. So, you know, I believe just as literally as Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and were barred from eating the literal tree of the tree of life, I believe literally we're going to eat um, the fruit of the tree of life, and that is ultimately going to seal our immortality. Now, just in the light of this, some of you may remember uh, in John chapter 20, verse 17, when Jesus rose from the dead, remember Mary saw him there. Uh, initially, she didn't recognize that it was him, but, but finally, probably through tears, you know, she realized this is Jesus. Wow, he's risen, and she's, she's clinging to him. And Jesus says to her, touch me not. It's not a great translation. That's the way the authorized puts it. In the Greek, uh, the word touch means to fasten, to fasten. And modern translations actually render it, stop clinging to me. And you can imagine that. Mary, she's, she's now got her Jesus back. She's clinging probably to his feet. And, and, and Jesus says to her, listen, Mary, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Interesting. So Jesus has risen, but he hasn't yet ascended to his father. And he's saying to Mary, listen, stop clinging to me. I've got to go somewhere. Um, I'll be back, right? I'll be back. I'll see you later. But I've got to go somewhere. And, you know, there, there's this question amongst Christians, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that we've already quoted, where it says, you know, um, we shall be raised, um, raised incorruptible. This, this corruptible shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some people ask, well, are we raised corruptible and then changed? Or are we raised incorruptible? Well, I believe there's a third alternative. And that's that we're raised very good. You remember, this, this was the way Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They weren't perfect. They weren't immortal, but they weren't sinners. They were just described as very good. They had the capacity to choose because they chose the wrong, but they weren't sinners. They weren't going to die until they disobeyed, but they also weren't going to live forever until they ate of the, the tree of life. And I believe when Jesus said, I have not yet ascended to my father, it's because he wanted, now that he'd been risen, not sinful anymore, but, but in a very good state, but still not fully born again, he wanted to go and see his father and eat of that tree of life. Now that's in the city of God. That's heaven, which of course is, is coming to work. So that's just a little aside, but it is interesting the way Jesus says, you know, I have not yet ascended to my father. He was itching. Itching to get there to complete the process, I believe. So, John, finally, can we be sure of our salvation if we're still along in the third and fourth step? Yeah, so the third one was again. Baptism, oh, you were listening. Good. Yeah, so the third one was baptism. Maybe we've just got baptized. Um, or we're in that fourth step. We've been baptized and we're now enduring until the end. You know, I've I've met a lot of Christians and I would call them dear Christians, genuine believers. But probably because of their church upbringing, they don't actually know if they're saved or not. And I think that's actually very sad. And it, it does have a bearing. Honestly, as I, as I look at their, their joy, their peace, it has a bearing on that. So the question is, although we're in the process of being saved, can we still, though, be, be confident of the end. 
and, and yes, yes, I believe we can and we should. And I don't know if I if I asked everyone with us today, you know, who who's taken the third step, being baptized, and now you're sort of you know, trying to make your, your calling and election sure. If I asked each one of you, are you 100% confident that salvation is a, is a done deal for you? Yeah, you know, it might be interesting. Some of you may be feeling not very confident, maybe a bit condemned. Well, I just want to share a few scriptures with you. And again, this is almost a subject in itself. And, and I think we have done this as a, as a standalone subject. But I just want to share a few scriptures just to close this out. Paul, he says in 2 Timothy, Chapter 1, verse 12, he says, For this cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. I am persuaded that he, God, is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That day. He's referring to the day of judgment, the day of the Lord the kingdom coming, and he's saying, I'm persuaded he is able to keep me until that day. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, but Paul was a dude. He was a spiritual legend. He was an icon. He didn't have the problems I have. He didn't, you know, have bad thoughts and sin like I do. Really? Is that right? Have a read of Romans 7 where he says, oh, wretched man. Those are the words he uses. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's Paul. Don't ever think just because he was used by God and he was a spiritual man that he didn't suffer in the flesh like the rest of us do. He calls himself a wretched man. And yet, because he believed in his new man and he'd repented in his new man, he'd been baptized and in his new man, yes, there's the old man, but we're trying to kill him, all right? And the new man you want to be saved, you can be persuaded. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident. Are you, are you getting these adjectives? Persuaded, confident, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you, he will perform it when? Until the day of Christ. In other words, he's going to perform what he started right up to the end. Romans 8, 29. Whom he did foreknow. So all of those who come to believe God, God foreknew, foreknew from the beginning of time. So he predestined us also. He foreknew us. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the final countdown, right? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he has also justified, and whom he justified, he has also, now notice the deliberate present tense of this, he has also glorified, present tense, believers, God has glorified you. In God's mind, and there's a scripture in Romans 4, 17. I love this scripture. It says, God speaks of things that be not as though they are. God speaks of those that be not as though they are. In other words, because he knows the future, he can declare, it's done. Okay, it needs our volition. As I said, it's a relationship. It's a covenant. We must want to be saved. But if your new man wants to be saved, you can be confident God will complete that until the day of Christ. Romans 8, verse 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And again in Romans 8, 37 to 39, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And that is the key here. God loves us. God doesn't hate us. He loves us. And then Paul goes on to say, I am persuaded. There it is again. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, governments, authorities, things present, things to come, height, 
depth, any other creature, nobody, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Listen, you can't go past that scripture, surely. And so I would say to all Christians, you know, if you want to be saved, if you followed through, you know, you believed God, you, you just got convicted in your heart of your sin and you've repented and you've been obedient to get baptized and you're, you're following through, you know, trying to make war with that old man, you really want to be a new creation, then please be persuaded, be confident that God is going to hold you. Jesus is going to hold you in the palm of his hand until the final day. And I tell you what, if you really come to terms with that, it will revolutionize your life. If, if you haven't been there before, you will be able to be more joyful rather than feeling the weight of that condemnation and that, that worry, that anxiety. Am I going to be saved? I don't know if I'm good enough. You know, I fail. That, that will be able to disappear and you'll be able to just enter into the true joy of the Lord and the, the genuine the genuine peace that comes from that. And I know having shared this with people, um, it does revolutionize their life. It, you know, the, the flesh is cunning. You know, we, we read about that first tempt of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, how he was more cunning, subtle. And of course, the serpent is an external now. He's within. You know, Jesus described sin, uh, the Pharisees, sin in general, as being like a generation of vipers, you know, serpent seed. So within us now is that serpent, and he's cunning. He's cunning. He will try to convince you. Oh, so you call yourself a Christian. He actually gave a talk last week on, on worry. You know, I'm not worrying. And here you are, you're worrying. Huh, some Christian you are. You should just give up. Give up now while you're ahead. And that old serpent. That old man of the flesh, he's out to get you. Paul talks about that, didn't he? We, we saw that. But Paul says, no, I bring, I bring my body under subjection. He also uses the analogy of a boxer in that same, um, same chapter, doesn't he? You know, I'm not like a shadow boxer. I really mean business, he says. So that's what we've got to do. Put that old man to death. And as the new man, woman, person in Christ, you can be persuaded. You can be confident that although you might only be on that fourth step to being saved, that it's a done deal. And it's just a matter of waiting patiently. And while we're waiting, working for the Lord. And ultimately, as we read in Romans 2, if we overcome, we shall eat of that tree of life and we shall be made um, immortal and live forever. No more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. So hopefully, Today, as we've discussed the subject of being born again, um, being ministered to, encouraged, and I don't know if anyone uh, perhaps had any questions or comments, feel free to, to unmute yourself and, and throw that in. I think Guy had a, a couple of comments I'll just pick up on, um, on, on the chat there. Um, Go back to that guy. Yeah, he um, he referred to pregnancy. Uh, of course, you're an expert on that guy. Um, about rowing coming before the birth. And, you know, the Bible does use, you know, that sort of analogy, you know, when we're born again of being like a, a new you know, a new baby. And of course, you know, like Candace is going through at the moment, there's a, a youngster growing in, in her womb, but it's growing. But it has to, to get sustenance before it can sort of burst forth and, and, and be born again. And, you know, the Bible says faith, and of course that was the first step, wasn't it? Faith comes by hearing the word of God, doesn't it? So the word of God needs to be a, a fundamental part of this. And you know, the reality is no one gets converted without the word of God in some some shape or form, either hearing it online, hearing it from someone else, hearing it from their family, you know, along the way. So I didn't see any other 
questions there, but if I missed anything, feel free to jump in. Okay, we'll, um, we'll carry on then into communion. So hopefully you've got your, your bread and wine. John. Yes, Guy? Yeah, sorry, just before you do, um, Joseph did have a, a little statement that he sent through, which I thought you might um, enjoy. He's talking about that he's heard um, about regeneration, justification, sanctification, um, and how does this play in relationship to us starting the procedure of being saved? Yeah, no, they're, they're all biblical words. Well done for throwing those in, Joseph. And of course, they're all they're all slightly different in meaning, um, but in another sense, they're synonymous. You know, to be sanctified basically means to be made holy, to be to be made clean, and uh, it's it's the same word used of God's Holy Spirit. And yet, we are described as being sanctified. You know, and the Bible says that basically, those who are sanctified and the sanctifier, we are one. And you know, this is the the beautiful thing that we can we can think of is that it's it's not as if we're going through the struggle of, of being born again separate. We are actually described as being one with Christ. He's the head, we're the body. He sanctified us, we are the sanctified, but we are one. And just as he is holy, he regards us as being holy. You know, his sacrifice enables for that estimation to be put upon us. So, yeah, that's that's an amazing thought. As far as uh, regeneration, the Bible also talks about restoration um, and restitution of all things, which, of course, comes at, at Jesus' coming. But again, you know, when we're born again, we are regenerated, aren't we? Um, you know, a lot of people who, who start the born-again experience when they get converted, they're a mess. Most of us, actually, probably. You know, we've been through a life of pride and self-centeredness. And even if we're young, you know, we've, we've had a few scars as a result of that. But when we get converted, the Bible says, you know, all of that is put away. You know, God casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. You know, and that's opposite. If you go east forever and you go west forever, you're never going to meet. And so it's telling us, you know, God forgets our sins. They're not counted. And, you know, in baptism, which we talked about as water, not only does it represent death, but it represents cleansing. And it uses the, the phrase that our sins have been washed away. You know, when you wash your clothes in a tub or you have a bath and then the, the water gets expelled, the water takes away the dirt, doesn't it? It doesn't bring it back to you. It takes the dirt away um, and you are left clean. And so these, these are all pictures that, yeah, the Bible uses. So, yeah, thank, thanks for bringing that up, Joseph. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, as we go into taking the communion, I remember talking to a Christian brother and, again, you know, a dear brother. Uh, he, he died young, um, sadly, but, you know, I'm confident he was in the Lord. Um, but we were talking about communion once. And again, you know, because of his church upbringing, he saw the communion as being a very somber, um, almost sad commemoration. And I, I get that because we are remembering the death of Christ. And um, he said it's, you know, in Australia and New Zealand, we have Anzac Day, where we remember the Australian and the New Zealand soldiers in World War II who fought together and died and so Anzac Day commemorates their death. And this chap I was talking to says, it's like that. You know, it's like Anzac Day. And I was saying, but, but Christ has risen. You know, we, we're, not, we're not having to be sad and somber because Christ has died like some soldiers have died in a war. Yes, it's part of it, but it, it doesn't end there. Um, we can only remember Christ. Like if, if he died, there's no point in remembering that. We don't have a saviour. We remember Christ because he rose again. And you all know how happy, we talked about Mary today, but the other disciples, how happy they were when they met Christ and how happy they were to actually suffer and be beaten. They came away rejoicing, it says in Acts 5. So, 
you know, I, I actually like our, our bread and wine commemoration to not just be focusing on the fact that Jesus died, full stop, but actually that he rose from the dead. And we can actually be really happy about that, very joyous. So it is a time of reflection. The Bible does say it's a serious thing. We've got to be examining ourselves, whether we're in the faith. But if we're in the faith, don't let this condemn you. The bread and the wine can be a, an actually a memorial of, uh, of great joy. So um, if I could ask uh, Phil, are you there in the picture somewhere? Yep. Um, would you mind giving thanks for the bread and wine, please? Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Precious Heavenly Father, we draw before you that now thankful for this opportunity of remembering your great love for each one of us. And we thank you for the love of your son. And we read that Jesus loved his own right up to the end. And it was with joy that he was able to go through that process. And when he came to the first memorial meeting, he said, I've, with great desire, he desired to do this with his disciples. And as he was on the cross, it was for the joy set before him that he was able to see beyond that painful death to the glorious situation which would result from his death and the bringing of all of his brethren and sisters to salvation. Please help us then, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread and the wine, which represent his body and blood. Of, and Father, we'd ask that you bless each one of us, that we with joy may continue before you, and that with joy we will be gathered with Christ to partake of these emblems anew in his glorious kingdom. Please bless us, each one, to that end. Accept our great thanks for of your goodness toward us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.